All right, welcome everybody. Um, we'd like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, improving open source security with reproducible builds. Um, so let's take a quick moment to introduce ourselves. Um, so this is Pierre van der Waal. Um, he's a participant at uh, Refspace, uh, and he is um, um, mainly interested in uh, reproducible builds from the Arch Linux uh, perspective. Uh, and I myself am Arnold Engele. I'm uh, active at uh, Hack42, uh, and I'm coming from the JVM angle. Uh, so this talk will be a general talk, to, so not specifically for Arch or the JVM, uh, but just, uh, um, uh, I think, making the case that reproducible builds is a useful concept uh, to improve the security of um, uh, open source software. So this will be a, a, a dual uh, presentation. Uh, I will take care of the first part, and then Jelle will take over for the uh, second part. Uh, so this is the quick overview of the agenda. Uh, so first, uh, let's make the case of why we think this is uh, uh, needed at all. Uh, then explain uh, what reproducible is and looks like. Uh, and then go into more detail um, uh, of um, how you do it, what tools are available to you uh, to uh, improve your security with reproducible builds, um, and some um, um, current developments and future work uh, in this area. So let's start with uh, why this is important in the first place. So do let's do a sort of like lightweight risk, risk analysis. Why do we have to care about this? Uh, so, are attacks on open source software relevant in the first place? Well, spoiler alert, we of course think so. So Black Duck open sor uh, source did a Black Duck did an, uh, a survey. Unfortunately, they stopped in 2016, um, but they have some nice numbers where um, uh, most uh, yeah uh, most numbers they surveyed, and of course this is a little biased, um, but um, would say they run on open source software. Um, and as reasons for that, they cite things like the quality of the solutions, uh, features, technical capabilities, and uh, the possibility to customize and fix. So it's no longer from a cost perspective, uh, but more um, these kinds of uh, reasons to choose for open source software. Um, so well over half of companies would consider FLOS uh, options before uh, looking at proprietary alternatives. Um, a report from a little uh, uh, more back is uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense. And so these guys saw, hey, within our organization, there's an increasing amount of uh, um, use of uh, free and open source software. Uh, maybe we should look into that. Maybe we should write a report about, is this a good idea? Should we ban this? What should we do with this? Um, so the interesting results from this uh, uh, report was, um, they actually depend heavily on free software. Um, the, re um, the overwhelming uh, recommendation was not to ban free software at the Department of Defense, and actually um, invest in it, promote it internally, uh, and make use of it more effectively. Um, so I think we've come a long way, like when I started in open source 20 years ago or something, um, it was like, Pretty exciting if you saw like actual commercial products who were running Linux or using open source. It's completely the other way around now. Like all the big financial institutions, uh, big corporations, they rely heavily on open source. Um, so I think it's worth it to make sure um, that the pipeline from development of open source software to the actual uh, running of it in production uh, is also secure and no malware is inserted in that process. Okay, so this, does this actually happen? So are developers targeted um, um, to impact actually their users and their customers? Because that is what reproducible target uh, builds uh, help secure, is um, the gap between uh, the developer on one side and the person actually running the code on the other side. Well, yes, this actually happens. Um, so there was this one guy um, who took some time to look into Homebrew. Uh, so Homebrew is a package manager for macOS. Uh, it's very widely used. Um, and this guy just like, looked at the Jenkins configuration and found some keys. And so basically, he could have um, uh, 
owned the Jenkins machines of Homebrew and basically um, to, to take control over the macOS machines of everyone who used Homebrew. Luckily for us, in this case, he didn't, and I, he did a responsible disclosure. Uh, but this is pretty scary. Now, of course, this went well, because this was a white hat guy. Uh, but uh, even more recently, in November of last year, uh, there was a very widely used Node.js uh, package, um, which fell into the wrong hands. Uh, and there was some uh, malicious JavaScript code added to, the, um, uh, to their deployable. It was fairly hard to detect. I mean, they made some mistakes making it easier to, de uh, to detect in this case. Uh, but, but this actually went live, and actually uh, this code made it into a lot of places. So luckily for us, this, was, this malware was very targeted, so they specifically targeted one downstream application in which they injected some kind of Bitcoin wallet stealing thing. Uh, but this is really scary because a lot of our like critical infrastructure, uh, large organizations are relying on these kinds of libraries. And if they get malware in injected into their systems, of course there's like more ways to contain that risk, but it's very scary. <coughs> so luckily, there's a lot of things we can do to make this less scary and less prone to attacks. One thing to make clear is that I, I'm uh, talking a lot about the risks of open source software. Uh, on the other side, there's proprietary software. Um, the risks are even bigger there, because there you actually have no way at all to verify that uh, there's no malware in the binaries. Uh, in open source soft software, at least you have some chance and uh, we will show here that there are some tools to make more, uh, to leverage that, uh, uh, those capabilities more. <coughs> um, okay, so lo let's look at the um, uh, open source development uh, pipeline in a little bit more detail uh, to see where reproducible builds fits. So I think in like uh, a bird's eye view, the development process looks like the developer writes some code, commits it to source control, then builds and packages it, the package is distributed, and then the user runs the software. Now let's take a quick look at what can go wrong and what we can do against it. So if the developer writes code, what can go wrong? Well, the developer himself can be malicious. That's a problem. Uh, but also a non-malicious developer can be blackmailed, can be coerced, maybe by the government, maybe by some criminal organization or individual. Um, and also, he can go to a hacker conference or some other place where um, he doesn't take good care of her, his machines, and his, his machine can get compromised. So there's a very real chance that the developer gets infected. So what can we do about this? I don't think we can do a lot. But I think we can take some countermeasures, so it doesn't matter that we don't fully trust the developer in this side. Because the developers commit to source control. So here's, you can, uh, the threat can be that the uh, source control hosting is compromised. But luckily we can use signed commits. Um, in some cases it's, it's easy to see if uh, something deeper in the commit tree was, uh, um, was changed. I'm, I'm not going to go too deep to, uh, into this, but the point is, at some point, you can do an audit of the source code, both manually and automatically, um, and you can uh, ensure yourself that there's nothing weird in there. Now, the next step is building and packaging. Here, we can have problems because our dependencies are uh, already um, uh, attacked, or when our build machine is attacked. Well, when our dependencies are attacked, basically we're out of luck. So what we have to do there is we have to also verify the integrity of the dependencies we use. For the compromised build machine, that's where reproducible builds come in, comes in. So that's the area of the pipeline that reproducible builds help, helps secure. Well, then the package is distributed. That's not a really a solved problem, I think, but at least it's a well-known problem. So, yeah. Basically, signatures, checking, those kinds of things, you can't do a lot more. Would it be useful to also help with this? I mean, 
Yeah, it's it's a little blurred, but yes. Yeah. So recapping, developers write code committed to source control. It's built and packaged. The package is distributed. The user runs the software. Well, we can't really secure the developers, but we can check that there's no foul play um, in, the in, in the source control tree. Then we can build and package it, and s we hope uh, reproducible builds will help here. Distribute that package and then check that the reproducible build certified package is indeed distributed to all uh, participants. Okay, so now I think, I hope I have convinced you that reproducible builds, um, uh, that the uh, open source development pipeline is something that's worth protecting and that there's a hole in the build system uh, step of the process. Uh, and that hole is what if your the machine where you're building your um, uh, uh, your artifact, what if that machine is compromised somehow? Uh, then you're out of luck, and then you're distributing malware uh, to your customers and to your users, and that would be bad. So we assume so if we assume source control is okay, then the concept of reproducible builds is that we don't build and package our software once but we uh, build it multiple times on different uh, and really different machines. Um, so a diverse set of machines. And then we check that the diverse set of machines, um, they all come to the same uh, uh, resulting artifact. So this means if one of the machines Exactly. So that doesn't solve compromised machines, but at least you can detect it if one of your machine is com machines is compromised. Of course, if all your machines are, are compromised, you're sh still out of luck. Um, but I think this is a useful thing to check. So typically, this would be a CI machine and maybe a, some other environment like a developer machine. If those agree uh, uh, on the packaged uh, uh, result, then you have a, higher, a much higher confidence that there's no foul play injected there. Um, but, but for this to happen, so, so this sounds pretty simple and obvious, right? Um, but for this to happen, um, we need to remove unreproducibility from the build and package step. And that's the practical work that, you, that we need to do to achieve the goal of reproducible builds. Um, and uh, Yellow will go into uh, some sources of unreproducibility uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, but reproducible builds, besides the, I think, the main advantage of uh, checking that none of your build machines are compromised, has some other uh, advantages. Um, so um, in, uh <coughs> uh, in one case, um, the distri uh, distribution, uh, the the build process of uh, uh, an application uh, generated the key at build time. Um, and some distributions generated that key at the build server and then distributed it to all the clients. Uh, so this was obviously, obviously not what was intended um, because now everyone was sharing the same key instead of every user having the same key. Uh, and using reproducible builds, uh, uncovered this um, uh, this problem in the uh, in the packaging of this application. So here it was more of a bug in the packaging uh, than in the um, building of the software itself. Uh, but this is also part of the uh, build cycle. Um, it can also help in uh, caching. Uh, so for example, the Bazel build tool when it builds a large project, then it builds a dependency tree of all the parts of the project. And if we now, so here we have a main which depends on main.cc and an intermediate result which depends on x.cc. If we now change x.cc, but we only change a comment and we run the build tool again, then it can see that the result x is the same as last time and it doesn't have to compile main again because nothing changed, um, uh, no, nothing material changed. Um, so um, these kind of caches work much better uh, if your build is reproducible. So reproducible here really means bit per bit the same result 
and uh, because you get bit per bit the, the same result, these kinds of caches uh, get much more efficient. Um, and if you set up things right, you can even use a distributed cache in your uh, organization, um, which has its own problems, but it can make things uh, a lot faster. Do you want to pick it up for me? Okay, sure. Um, so other bugs, uh, other advantages are um, bugs found when building in different environments. For example, um, if you have uh, sorting um, on the with different locales, gives different outputs or shell specific uh, bugs. A bug we had in our uh, Pac-Man package manager is that it calculates the size of a package, but uh, the calculation method differs per file system, which introduced non-deterministic uh, packages and uncovered an actual software bug. Um, there are also builds uh, which fail, which were found which failed uh, x percent of the time, uh, like race conditions or when you run stuff. Uh, when the developer only runs it on one tra thread and you run it on four, yeah, weird things ha can happen. And um, now we're going to talk about how, in practice, uh, so this reproducible uh, build concept was started, um, uh, let me see, I believe five years or six years ago. And, well, how hard can it be to Compile software on two different machines and get the same uh, same result. Well, that's actually actually pretty pretty hard. So the first uh, time Debian attempted this, they get uh, they got 24 packages re reproducible, and um, a lot of problems um, were found, uh, which required which led to more tooling to be made. So this is where I will uh, talk about now. Um, so the most common uh, re unreproducible uh, builds are caused, for example, by uh, iterating over hashes, which is usually not uh, deterministic. So you have to sort uh, them first. Um, some, most um, compilers record the build path in your binary uh, when you re create a, a debug build. Um, this is obviously unreproducible because my build path is Probably not uh, the same as yours. Uh, a big issue was timestamps, which were generated on build time, um, which led to uh, non-deterministic builds. Um, Herefore, actually, a specification, the source.epoch started, which um, if in a special environment a variable is set, it will replace um, the timestamp set in uh, the C header, for example, which makes uh, the build deterministic. Uh, file ordering, so for example, if you have some assets which you, you need to uh, build into your binary and you do a read here of this directory, uh, then the file ordering isn't the same on all file systems. Um, private keys were all and, and or seeds were already mentioned. And a lot of uh, binaries or uh, configuration files, they, they rely on specific user groups, um, which you might not have. Oh, yeah. Um, so here, for example, the timestamps, um, this is still an issue in uh, a lot of packages. Uh, so that file ordering. Um, private key which is generated on build and another uh, form one was an, an initialization seed which would be the same for every package which would, is obviously bad. Um, to help uh, detect these issues so we have the, uh, the reproducible build project uh, created a, lot, a set of tools and the first one is Diffoscope which is a diff on steroids and it's more than your average diff tool because it can handle multiple uh, formats. 